Every year around this time, the whole country goes a little basketball crazy. Perhaps I'm exaggerating a little, but it's quite harmless, isn't it? For a while, we focus on something other than which politicians are robbing us and which countries in the world want to destroy us. One of the rare things that can bring us all together is when we root for our favorite teams. At least, that's how I always thought about it. I should probably know a little more about this than the average person, because I'm a basketball coach and got to see it all from the inside this year. This story has been big news for quite some time. It even pushed the winners off the front pages of newspapers where only the lazy didn't wonder why the hell I did this. I had reporters and TV crews from all the major networks standing on my doorstep, trying to get interviews. Unfortunately for them, I wasn't there. After it was over, I sat down in the university president's office with him and the athletic director to discuss what we should do, and then came up here to think. Here, of course, is Crystal Lake. I remember this place from childhood, but as far as I remember, there was once a camp on the other side of the lake. But a few years after I grew up, some incident happened there. The entire camp was eventually demolished to try to erase memories of what happened there. I don't think that they succeeded, just as I don't think that I will be able to forget what happened to me. My name is Jim Turner. I am, at least for now, the head basketball coach at the University of Pineland. You see, I knew that as soon as I told you this, you would immediately start looking at me strangely. Are you also wondering why I did this? Maybe you or someone you know lost money on this game? All I can say is, never bet money you cannot afford to lose. Or maybe that nothing is certain. Never count your chickens before they hatch. I hope some of this helps you feel a little better. Of course it doesn't work for me. But then, I lost a lot more than money. Fifteen years ago, I was the starting point guard on my college team. I was pretty good and started getting interest from NBA teams my sophomore year, but this was not destined to come true. In the last game of the second season, I jumped and the guy guarding me hit me in the air. It didn't help him, I scored anyway. But when I landed and I landed awkwardly, a small sound came from my knee. It actually didn't hurt much, just a burning sensation. And two days later, I could not walk at all. My knee grew to the size of a cantaloupe, and I was scheduled for Sir Jerry. This turned out to be the last game in my life. Even after several surgeries performed by the best doctors in that state, they could not do anything. I'm certainly glad that I can walk without pain. But my knee will never allow me to run faster than a light jog. And even then I have to wear a knee brace, run on soft surfaces, and be very careful when changing direction. Any attempt to jump or jump brings me extreme pain and several days of recovery. After several years of bitterness, during which I had to work out a little, I returned to basketball, this time as a volunteer assistant coach. It was very different from when I was a player. At first, I was nothing more than a glorified errand boy, ensures that all training equipment and balls are kept ready for each practice. I kept track of training times because there were rules against training players for more than a certain time each day or each week. I also had to make sure that the players' grades were at a certain level. Sometimes this meant talking to professors or even choosing subjects that were not only easy, but also those where the teacher understood the big picture. Soon I also became a fundamentals coach. My job was to work with the incoming freshmen and make sure they were ready to play in college. It was a big step up for them from playing in high school. The game became faster and more dynamic. Some of our most highly rated prospects simply couldn't make the transition. There was also a period when they had to realize that there were literally thousands of people coming to every game and millions watching on TV. Some of these kids didn't even know how to dribble. Others are so used to the fact that their height advantage over most of the people they played against at school means they barely have to jump. Therefore, they were never able to develop a good throw. Of course, there were those who believed that since they had such a good shot, they didn't need to develop any defensive skills. My job was to identify their weaknesses and strengths and make them stronger where they were weak and even stronger in their specialties. Perhaps the biggest difference with this position was that it gave me real status on the coaching staff and a salary. Our head coach, Geriatric, seemed to take me under his wing. 
He asked my opinion on various issues and began taking me with him on recruiting trips. Of course, we never managed to get the best recruits. Even in our area, our college was too small to interest anyone. All the top kids wanted to go to Michigan State University or Michigan State University, but we performed well in our conference and dreamed that someday we would get into big-time sports. I'd like to pretend that my life was great and that I was at peace with everything. The truth is that this is not true. I was a professional on the field and at work, but away from school, I was not myself. It was not uncommon for me to spend most of my evenings in seedy downtown bars, drinking away large chunks of my small salary, while I lamented how unfairly God had taken my knee and my career away from me, giving it to a bunch of kids who didn't appreciate or deserve it. What they have. Thinking back on it, I think I was lucky because my life could have changed in one of several different ways. First, the amount of hard liquor I was drinking could have destroyed my liver and killed me, or one of the university fans or alumni or even a relative of a current student or player could hear my whining and report me. This could have ended my career, or while I was drunk, someone could rob me and kill me, or even one of the women I came home too often with could contract a terrible disease and pass it on to me. When drunk, every woman you talk to is at level 10. If you think this is one of those cases where the hero gets back on his feet and lives on because of his amazing ethics, morality, and determination to do the right thing, you will be sorely disappointed. If I were left to my own devices, I would ruin my life. My carefully crafted facade of professionalism was just beginning to crack at the edges when this happened. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had two years left before graduating from university and was in my third year of coaching. It all happened three days after my 24th birthday. We just defied the odds and beat Eastern Virginia Tech. It was the eighth game in a row that we had won at home and everyone was feeling really good. The problem was that we couldn't beat ranked teams and we just didn't know how to win on the road. I wrote down everything we did well during the game and was still sitting on the bench when the stands emptied. It was my habit to sit and re-watch every game long after the pats on the back from well-wishers and fans had ended. I liked the loneliness of the empty hall. The silence was filled with echoes of cheers and the constant sound of the ball hitting the floor, even if they had long since ended. Most of the players and even the coaches were outside celebrating our victory while I went over the list of things each player needed to work on before the next game. She didn't make a sound. I don't know what made me look up from my notebook and look into the most beautiful blue eyes I've ever seen, but I did. She smiled and I waved to her. I think this was a signal for her that she could approach me. I was ready for her arrival. Hello, she began. She smiled again and hesitated, as if not knowing what to say next. She was so beautiful that I decided to make it easier for her. Sorry, I said, but most, well, probably even all the guys left. However, if you write down your name, phone number, and the name or number of the guy you're interested in, I'll give it to him the next time I meet. If you have an envelope, you can write its number or name on the outside, and then even I won't be able to read it. Her smile changed. On such a beautiful face, it was surprising that her expression could change so smoothly although by all indications she was still smiling. The corners of her beautiful lips softened very subtly. I don't think you could measure the difference with a micrometer. Her eyes had lost quite a bit of their intensity. Again, the degree of difference was so small that most people wouldn't notice it, but for me, it was huge. So this is how your life works, she asked. Do you put people into small cells, like on the piece of paper you are looking at, Every person you meet is instantly measured, rated, and placed into a position in a small square, like in some basketball game. Now the only one who was confused was me. I looked at her again. She was still as beautiful as she had been a few seconds ago, but now I began to doubt her sanity. Unconsciously, I covered the notebook. I guess I was hoping it would seem like a natural movement and not like I was accusing her of anything. She came even closer to me. So you think that I'm a woman of easy virtue, right? She asked. Or worse, 
Am I here to steal your precious playbook and notes? She sat down on a bench a little away from me. How can you sit on this thing? She asked. My butt already hurts. I looked at her and smiled. She smiled back and then frowned. Don't try to change the subject, she said. I'm still trying to get my point across. Perhaps it would be easier for you to do this if I knew what you wanted to say, I remarked. Oh, yes, she said. You decided that I was a woman of easy virtue who came here to meet one of your players. Do you think I'm just going to be another notch in some guy's belt because he's probably a damn idiot who can jump into the air and throw a ball through a hoop? I tried to fight, but my facial muscles were beyond my control. I didn't say a word. He didn't utter a single syllable or make a sound, but suddenly she became angry. If you think so, then fuck you, she shouted. In the quiet hall, her voice increased at least several times. The last two words echoed into infinity, bouncing off the walls with each iteration becoming slightly less audible. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, and you, 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 S. Her beautiful, smiling, confident face turned into a mask of rage and pain. I saw tears appear in the corners of her eyes. She turned and tried to leave, but I grabbed her hand. Look, I'm not judging you, I said. I know how it happens. You are young and should have the opportunity to experience everything. You never know what might happen. You are certainly quite beautiful. Maybe he will see you and feel the same. Her face became even redder and it seemed as if it was about to split into two parts. Why do the most beautiful girls become the ugliest when they are upset? No, you don't know a damn thing about how this happens, she snapped. Of course I know, I snorted. I was once one of them. Now it's my turn to be angry. Of course, it was a long time ago, but it happened that girls stayed after games to try to get to know me. But you never suggested that to any of them, she snorted in response. Our faces were so close to each other that we could have kissed. How do you know that I... I began. James Turner, number 56, she said. Your jumper was your best throw. You preferred the right side of the court. You had problems with your left side. It was your weakness. On the left side of the basket, you could barely make a shot. Your free throw percentage last season was almost 90%. Most teams hated fouling you because, from the line, you were money in the bank. However, some teams began to figure you out. When you moved to the right side of the court, they created a double guard or tried to pin you on the left. My mouth dropped open. If you had played the last two years, you probably would have been a first-round draft pick. That is, of course if he had spent these two years developing his skills on the other side of the court. Ancient history, I said. But thanks for the trip into the past. Is that why you came? Stayed after the game and waited all this time to remind me that a few. Years ago, I was a great idiot on one side of the court. Thank you very much. I don't think every day about what could have been. You're pretty bitter, aren't you? She asked. I heard that bitterness can dull you. I can't understand this. It seemed to me that this made no sense. Now I see. There is. Happy life. She got up and left. This time she looked back at me and there was something different in her eyes. In the last five minutes or less, I've seen her happy and confident, confused and angry. And now I saw something like pity in her eyes. Wait a minute, I said. Why did you even come down here? She stopped but didn't turn around. She seemed to be wondering if she should even talk to me. I think the desire to talk won out because she turned and came back to me. I've been to all your games, she said, all season. I don't understand, I said. And you'll probably never understand such an attitude, she said. Jim, have you ever thought about the possibility that I like you? And that I like you for reasons that have nothing to do with basketball? Maybe I saw you at school, found you attractive, and wanted to get to know you. Believe it or not, you really are very cute. But, like most men, you see yourself in some strange, one-dimensional way. Most men see themselves as some kind of extension of their work. Women only see the guy they care about. So, I don't care if you're a basketball player, a coach, or a plumber. I would just like to have a chance to get to know you better before I graduate from college and decide what my life is going to be like. My mouth opened again. 
Is this the part where you ask my name and ask me to go on a date with you? She asked. Then in this part, I answer, Gloria, and yes, I agree. Over the next few months, Gloria changed me. She stopped me from drinking myself into oblivion and forced me to evaluate my situation. Of course, I couldn't play basketball anymore, but if I really love the game, being a coach is almost as good and my career will last much longer. Additionally, at the college level, teams experienced so much turnover of players that programs became more identified with the coaches than with any of the team members. When you think of the Michigan State basketball team, who do you think of? While there were many legendary players there, you think of Tom Izzo more than any of them. This made me think that maybe she was right. It's time to leave behind what could have been and focus on what can actually be. Of course, I also fell hard and fast for Gloria. Less than a year has passed since we got married. I quickly rose through the ranks of the coaching staff and soon found myself in line to take Atrick's place. I had several offers from other small colleges and even a few offers as an assistant coach at several larger schools. I didn't want to make such decisions without Gloria's participation, and I was very surprised when she said that she thought we should stay put. You know this program better than anyone else, she said. Jerry himself wants you to replace him when he's ready to retire. Besides, this is our home, our life. This is the ideal place for us to have children. I loved Gloria so much that I would have done anything she said anyway. You know all those stories about players and fans getting, or almost getting, run over by the stands? I think Gloria and I were the reason why there were so many rumors about coaches and women at our university. We made love like rabbits whenever and wherever possible. We had a very active and spontaneous sex life, but it accumulated over the years. Gloria was embarrassed the first time we did this because I wasn't her first man. I was the second man she had sex with. The first was some guy she met when she was 20. He literally charmed her. He took her, and she never heard from him again. Of course, she heard about it from everyone she knew, and even from some she didn't know. The experience was painful and did not bring her satisfaction. So she decided that the next time she did it, she had to actually be in love with this man. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth it. She told me all this through her tear-filled eyes. Glow, why are you telling me this? I asked her. Because I don't want you to be disappointed that you're not the first man I've been with, she sobbed. But I still want you to know that in my heart, I am all yours and will always be yours. Glow, darling, I said. I love you. And the fact that I'm not the first won't change that. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. All he could give you was pain and bad memories. I will be with you until the end of your life. I'll get the cheese glow. And now, having been married for ten years, we still love each other just as much as we did then. Of course, a few years ago, we discovered that if we wanted to have children, we would have to resort to one of these alternative methods or have someone carry the baby to term. Gloria couldn't get pregnant. She was devastated, and I took her on an extended vacation to remind her how much I loved her. I told her the best thing for us was to take a couple of years and decide what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. Everything from surrogacy to adoption was still within our reach to have children. We just had to be more thoughtful about it. Of course, we learned that hiring a surrogate mother and the medical procedures involved are beyond the scope of a junior trainer's salary. We kept that in mind and realized that Jerry wouldn't be coaching forever, maybe for another year or two at the most. Gloria began to plan. I think things got a little hectic at the time, and maybe since Gloria and I were doing well, it just slipped my mind. My life also changed then, because one evening in the middle of the game, Jerry had a heart attack. While the other coaches were looking at each other, trying to decide what to do, I just took Jerry's notes and started telling the players what to do. He also started shouting at the judges. We were eight points behind. Jerry recovered from his heart attack, and we won the game. There were both the deputy director and the dean. There was no question of who should coach the team for the rest of that season and into the future. I received a salary increase. I still wasn't getting anywhere near what the big guys were getting, but Gloria and I were more than comfortable. Besides, I was now free to do my own thing started checking out high schools and playgrounds in some of the more crime-ridden and low-income parts of the state. 
In places like Flint and Highland Park, children were more likely to end up in prison than in college. I've talked to several parents who have transferred to different schools for the opportunity to get their kids into, not necessarily the NBA, but even just a chance at college and a decent future. My track record was terrible. Of the eight kids I considered promising, three joined gangs and went to prison before graduating from high school. Two more dropped out of school before their senior year. One got his girlfriend pregnant and found himself a job. Another one died of a drug overdose. And the last one. He became my starting point guard. Jamal Johnson was as slippery as an ice cream lollipop in the game. He was a completely unselfish player and also completely undaunted. Jamal kept his nose clean, his grades were high, and he enjoyed his first year of college, made friends, and studied well. The only problem was that he didn't fit in with the other players on our team. He had great leadership abilities, but unfortunately, he was the only player on the team with the potential to go beyond the box in which we found ourselves. By the end of his first season, other colleges were trying to take him away from me. This gave me an idea. If other schools can try to poach my players, why can't I? I will, of course, stay within the rules. I wouldn't go after current players on any team, but what about their children who have left the team? Over the summer, I studied almost all the existing teams, and I found what I was looking for. I found other players to put them next to Jamal. From, oh damn, I can't stand tech, I found my champion. Okay, he didn't look much like a defender. I couldn't even dribble. But Timmy Turner could shoot from anywhere on the court. He had already dropped out of his small technical college in West Virginia and was about to lose his basketball scholarship. He had two options, move to Michigan or work in the coal mines. The choice was difficult, but he chose Michigan. My assistant coaches looked at me like I was crazy. Have you seen any films about this guy? They asked. I nodded. Can you prove that he can move? Some of them asked. I just smiled because I had a plan. Timmy reminded me of someone. I found my two forwards in two equally unlikely places. I found Igor Vastichevsky in a bakery in Hamtramck. He had a break from the cooking pack, a traditional Polish donut filled with jam or other sweet filling and topped with powdered sugar or icing. And I saw him playing with a group of black children in the area. For a white guy, he expressed himself like they did, looked like a taller version of rapper Eminem. Of course, I found Joel Grissom in prison. He was caught stealing anything that wasn't nailed down in his area. The judge gave him a choice. Join the army, go to college, or go to prison. Joel thought that if he joined the army, he would be killed. No matter how hard he tried, he could not go to college to save his life. After pulling a few strings and getting his case heard by a judge, I was able to get Joel out of jail. His release was contingent on him going to college. There was also a condition that he remain clean and not engage in any criminal behavior. If his name is in any way connected with any offenses, he will be sent back to prison. The judge also placed a very complex bracelet on him. It was different from those worn by guys released from guards for the period of work. In addition to allowing you to determine his location at any given time, he saves all the places he has visited. Joel was so tired of this that he was ready to try anything to get free. In the second season, we won many more games, although my team had not yet had time to really play. The only thing I was really missing was more presence in the center. Even some of the larger colleges in our area were impressed with my team. They were called the best three-and-a-half team ever seen. That summer, I found my missing piece. Surprisingly, he was already right under my nose. Billy Bathgate was a student at my college. He was a wrestler from Boston. His height was almost 2 meters 13 centimeters, and he was still growing. He had been kicked off the wrestling team for being too aggressive and was about to lose his scholarship. I spent the summer teaching Billy the basics of basketball. Unfortunately, his throws were either in the bullseye or in the milk. Over the summer, I was able to teach him a few basic skills, taught me how to pass, throw, and hit the ball with my elbow. Billy's job was to keep opposing players out of the paint. Jamal handled everything else. Jamal's transition into senior year was daunting. I was convinced that we were on the cusp of greatness, 
but my employees looked at my team as if they were all from the island of misfit toys. Our attack was simple but devastating. The pick-and-roll combination has been used by NBA and college teams since the beginning of time. Everything was based on Jamal's reading and understanding of the situation. Jamal was my unconditional leader. He was the second coming of Jordan. He distributed the ball around the court in such a way that no one could ever tell who would be in scoring position. Learn to use the weaknesses of other players to our advantage. Igor and Joel were lovers of scoring goals. It was not difficult for Jamal to attract attention to himself and then pass the ball to one of them who was in a scoring position. This made the two of them more deadly. And since Jamal was mainly driving the ball, the two of them could freely go into the striking position. Freed from defenders in anticipation of the ball, they ran like track and field stars. Billy had a tendency to be rude, and betting on him getting fouled was a nightmare. You could just as well just put zeros. His free throw percentage was low. When he hit, we were all surprised. Surprisingly, very few teams tried to foul him as a strategy. At the beginning of the season, Billy put in a few players and most of our opponents didn't want to mess with him. But on the bright side, as Billy played more games, he became a rebounding machine. A common sight on both sides of the court was him jumping up, snatching the ball out of the air or out of an opponent's hands, and passing it to Jamal. If Jamal was covered, deadly elbows would keep defenders at bay until Jamal was free. All that remained was the motionless Timmy Turner. Timmy's job wasn't to play offense or even try to defend too hard. Timmy was clumsy as a bear. He had a habit of tripping not only over his own feet, but also over everyone he tried to look after. Timmy's job was to stand somewhere on the outskirts of the three-point zone and get comfortable. Most teams double-teamed Jamal and Billy, so if Jamal found himself double-tagged and couldn't get free, he would simply throw the ball to the deadly Timmy Turner in the three-point zone and make the opponent pay. If Jamal was my low-cost Michael Jordan, then Billy was Bill Lamebeer and Timmy was Steve Kerr. During their senior year, we finished undisputedly first in our conference and made the NCAA tournament. For the first time in the history of the college, we were in a big sport. We would have gone much further than the first round, but my guys had no experience playing at this level. We also had no bench or reservists. If Bill had a breakdown, which was not uncommon, or was sent out of the game, as he was against our opponent in the first round, things quickly went south. This is how we came to this year. Over the summer, I had the chance to develop every aspect of the player's game and even raise the standards of some of the supporting players. I had at least gotten them to the point where, if I had to take one of my five out for a rest, the whole game wouldn't fall apart and we could at least stick close. Billy has really developed a short-range shot and a very effective jumper from the same distance. He also developed acting skills. I sent him to an improv class in our performing arts department. The goal was for him to get some of those close chances by playing the flop and pretending to be hurt. During the season, he was able to use his acting talents to master the ball. On several occasions, he actually ran into opposing players, beat the crap out of them, and made it look like he was being beaten out of him. Everyone paid attention to us, not only around our school, but at our games and on our campus. Sports Illustrated and ESPN were frequent guests. The deputy director and the dean, both my friends, were delighted. Because we beat many perennial champions throughout the season, the Las Vegas odds called us this year's Cinderella. All the experts predicted that we would fail, perhaps reaching the final four or even beyond. Gloria seemed to support the team as much as I did. She filled out the tournament bracket just like all the guys on campus and even asked me to help her with it. I was sure she was making two and three dollar bets with the ladies in her club, just like everyone else on campus. I was interviewed by so many magazines and sports programs that I couldn't keep track of them all. This year, our opponents in the first round were badly beaten. We beat them by 20 points. We also broke their spirit during the game and did it in style. On our side of the court, Igor missed an easy jump shot. But when it bounced off the backboard, Billy grabbed the ball to get a second chance. He passed the ball to Jamal, who immediately passed it across the court to Joel. Joel was rushed by two defenders, 
but he immediately threw the ball up toward the basket in the perfect position for Jamal to parachute, slamming the ball into the net with unbridled ferocity. From this throw, the entire shield shook and vibrated so loudly that the crowd was stunned into silence. We scored another 15 unanswered points, and any questions about us being a one-time team like last year were put to rest. My team, my staff, and the entire university celebrated the victory and looked forward to the next game. My starting five was on the cover of Sports Illustrated that week, with a little insert of me rooting for them. It got to the point where I couldn't drive on the streets. Riots broke out wherever my torch-colored red Mustang was seen. My car's MagnaFlow exhaust system was loud enough to be heard before I even got there. I've thought several times about buying a less noticeable car, but this car was the first thing I gave myself, and I liked it. After two more wins against good teams, not only were we in the Elite Eight, but our path seemed clear. Our next opponent was UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, which we beat twice in the regular season. We beat them both home and away in front of their local crowd. ESPN thought we were in the running for our first trip to the Final Four. That evening, I was so happy that I didn't know what to do. After the game, I wanted to go and celebrate and called Gloria, but her phone went straight to voicemail. I assumed she had gone out for drinks with the girls, as she did after most games this season. The girls were the dean's wife, Harriet, and the vice principal's wife, Millicent. Over the past ten years that we have been married, the years have been kind to both me and Gloria. She had gained a few pounds, mostly around her breasts and butt, but she was still beautiful. The slight curve of her belly only emphasized her femininity. Now she was as sexy to me as the day we met. Harriet and Millicent were a little older, and while I wouldn't call them sexy, they were fun. We all got together for barbecues and even went on a few trips together in the summer. I didn't stop Gloria from having a little fun with her friends. God knew she deserved it for putting up with my obsession with the team during the season. The term basketball wives was coined specifically for women like Gloria, Harriet, and Millicent. Since I couldn't find my wife, I decided to celebrate with the team. I thought that the opportunity to communicate would be good for us. Moreover, Jamal graduated from college this year. The other guys have another year ahead of them, and I have several recruits who can take Jamal's place. I also have a few more players in mind. I'm sure that next year's team may not be as good, but we have a good chance of getting into the tournament again. I also started getting better quality recruits. After we made the tournament two years in a row, the players began to take our small college seriously. I also received coaching offers from several larger colleges that I should have considered. I decided that after the tournament, Gloria and I would decide our future together the way we always do. I walked out of the room and dodged several reporters who wanted to interview me. Good God, we have a press conference scheduled for early tomorrow morning and another one in the morning before the game two days later. Isn't that enough? What else can I say that I didn't say when I was interviewed before the game? As I was making my way to my Mustang, my cell phone rang. I ignored him at first, looking to see if it was Gloria, but it wasn't Gloria although I recognized the area code and number and answered immediately. Hi, Sheila, I said. Hi, Jim, she replied. I called to thank you and let you know that you made him happy in recent years thanks to what you did with the team. He always said that since we only have daughters, you were like the son he never had. He respected you both as a player and as a coach. He always said that you were the best player he had ever seen and that your knowledge of the game on the field made you the manager you became. Sheila, why are you talking in the past tense? I asked. Jim, Jerry died an hour ago, she said. He died cheering for his team and watching you take them further in the tournament than he ever dreamed possible. If that matters, he was happy. He died with a smile on his face. He was just telling our friends about how you always came to him for advice during the season and in the summer to plan your strategy for the next year and suddenly he fell silent after bragging to some of them that he was going to be on the bench with you in the tournament next year, if his health allowed. He just fell silent and left immediately after. I had no words. I just sat in the car and cried like a baby. Finally, I pulled myself together and spoke to her again. Sheila, 
he will be by my side wherever I go, and not only next season, but in all subsequent ones. Please call me and let me know about the arrangements so that I can attend the ceremony. I started the car, and the Mustang's usual aggressive growl became a little more subdued than usual. I'm sure most of you thought it was because of me, that I may have changed my driving style due to personal sadness. I really believed that the machine felt my pain and reacted accordingly. I went to the motel where my players were staying. There seemed to be a party going on there. Damn it. At first I thought, these guys should have thought better. But then I thought about it again and decided that life is too short, especially for young guys like them. There's just too much uncertainty. One day you're at the top, and the next day, it's all taken away from you. My case was a perfect example of this. I walked onto the court as the best player on my team, with a bright future ahead of me, and came down as a coach. There was no way I could refuse them something as simple as a party. As I approached their room, alarm bells started ringing in my head. Oh damn, there are girls with them. This is a major violation of university and conference rules. Of course, these are the rules that are most often ignored. Everyone knows that healthy young guys will have fun. But the rules are designed in such a way that any abuses and such things will not affect the participating universities or the conference. This stopped me from going inside. But I looked out the window. Although I sure as hell wish I hadn't, and to this day it's still the worst memory I've ever had. I saw Igor, all five foot eight of him, having sex with some blonde. Joel had sex with another woman. Next to the woman Joel had was Timmy, doing the same thing. Suddenly the realization came. The woman who had sex with Timmy is Millicent, the wife of the athletic director. She is at least fifty, if not more. The woman who was with Joel turned to me, and I saw that it was Harriet. I looked across the room, and my doubts that the young woman they were sharing with me was my own wife, Gloria, disappeared. The pain that rushed through me at that moment is incomprehensible to those who have not personally experienced it. It's like death. Gloria was more than my wife. She was my life partner, my best friend, my confidant, and my lover. All rolled into one. Gloria, more than anyone else, was responsible for giving me a second chance. Without her, I'd probably be dead right now, or rotting in some seedy bar. I wouldn't have the life I have now or any success. I wanted to scream or do something, but I did nothing. Just stood there. I took out my iPhone and took a few seconds of video, but did not go into the room and confront them. I didn't know what to say. I felt betrayed. Not only by the woman who just this morning swore to me again that she loved me more than anyone and anything in the world, but also by a team of misfits to whom I gave a second chance at success as confidently as Gloria gave me mine. As I turned to leave, I noticed a couple walking towards me. Of course it was Jamal. He was hugging a woman. No, it was a girl, a very beautiful Asian woman. Damn it. I recognized her too. One of my assistant coaches was named Jin Shu. This girl is his daughter, and she was completely absorbed in Jamal. I knew her father didn't want her to date him. He was very old school and wanted her to marry an Asian man. As they got closer, Jamal noticed me and tensed. He took her hand very gently. There was no doubt where they were going. Apparently, when it all started, Jamal also went after his woman. Coach, She's not to blame for anything, he said. I made her do it. I just shook my head and looked at him. It was obvious that no force had been used against her. It was also obvious that he loved her. The way he tried to stand up for her and lie for her sake did not allow for any other interpretation of the facts. I just rushed past them without saying anything. He returned to the car and drove off. I pulled into the parking lot of the first bar I saw, ordered a drink, and just kept pouring until I couldn't remember why I was doing it. I remember something buzzing during the night. But when I woke up the next morning, my head hurt so much that I couldn't remember anything. It felt like someone took an axe and just split my skull, and all my thoughts flowed out. I was lying on the bed, and the coverlet on it was pink. My shoes were on the floor next to the bed, but I was still fully dressed. As I tried to sit up, I groaned. The room began to spin, and my head hurt even more. 
My moans must have alerted someone because the door opened. A young woman, who must have been close to five feet tall, entered the room. Her black hair is pulled back into a ponytail that hangs to one side. She looked very beautiful. I looked around the room, wondering what the hell I had done and why. My phone rang again. It was the same buzzing noise I had been hearing all night. It's probably Glow, whoever she is, she suggested. They called you all night. They probably called hundreds of times. What's happened? I asked. How did I get here? Oh, it's simple, she said. Last night after you tried to rob the bar where I work, you passed out. I took you to my home. Why? I asked. That's not what you're thinking about, she said quickly. What am I thinking about? I asked. I don't think that I think at all. I don't think my brain is still working. Well, you made some pretty serious statements last night, she grinned. Oh, my God. So you remember some of this, she said. No, it's just an expression, I said. You said you would make love to me until I felt like I was in heaven, she said. I was drunk. Well, I don't know, coach, she said. You seemed pretty sane. They told me that it was a promise and that you wanted me to remind you of it. I looked at my feet. I'm married, I said. Or at least was married until last night. Maybe it was the desperation in my voice or the expression on my face, but all the sass and sarcasm was gone from her voice. She went into the kitchen and returned with a banana, a jug of Gatorade, and a cup of coffee. Your toast will be ready in a few minutes. I also made you some vegetarian bacon, she said. I'm a very good listener, if you want to tell someone about it. I looked at her. Everyone says it helps a lot to vent to a stranger, I said. So you put everything on your mind, and the other person doesn't care because they don't care about your problems. Then you probably shouldn't tell me anything, she said because I'm not a stranger. My name is Molly Anderson. I study psychology. I specialize in sports psychology. You allowed me to interview several of your players before and after your games here. Remember, you made them treat me kinder. They kept calling me a tall, skinny girl with no breasts. I think if they saw you now, you wouldn't have a problem with it, I said. My phone rang again. This time, I picked up the phone and looked at the screen. It wasn't Gloria. It was Jamal. I didn't answer his call either. Thank you, Molly, I said, trying to get up. I will not forget your kindness. Who knows what could have happened to me? No problem, she said. Someone had to take me home anyway. Your car is a beast. When I start my practice, I will buy myself the same one. I started putting on my shoes. As I bent down to tie them, I was sure my head was going to fall off. Coach, Maybe you should talk to someone about your drinking, she said. Molly, last night I caught my wife cheating. Before that, I didn't drink for ten years, I told her. I'm so sorry, coach, she said. Then I told her my sad story, and she actually turned out to be a good listener. But I knew I had to leave here. I've abused her hospitality long enough. Besides, I have things to do and decisions to make. I tried tying my shoelaces again and finally just told myself to forget about it and tighten them. I walked out of Molly's apartment and looked around for my car. I pressed the button on the key fob and heard a signal. The car was parked in the parking lot behind the building. I walked around the building and found her. I thought about going back to the hotel and meeting Gloria, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I went to the arena and to the office that was allocated to me and my employees. When I walked in, the time was earlier than I usually show up, especially on a day when we don't have a game. Jinju looked at me as I sat down. Hey, Jim, your wife wants you to call her, he said. She told me to call her as soon as I gave you the message. I'm going to call her right now to let her know that I told you and that she can expect your call. No need, I said. He looked at me strangely. Jin, can you look around the city and try to find me a room somewhere? But you already have a wonderful room in the same hotel as the rest of us, he said. Damn, your room is much nicer than the one I share with my wife and daughter. She is even more. Al, I said, moving on to the next guy. Find me a number. I don't care what kind of room it is or where it is. Just find me another room. 
Okay, boss, he said. Jim, I would find you a room too. What the hell is going on? Jin asked. Nothing, I said. Call Gloria and tell her you gave me her message. But, he began. Listen, I know you won't feel good about breaking your promise to her. So do it. But maybe after that you should start figuring out who you're working for. His face paled as he realized something was going on between me and Gloria, and he landed right in the middle of it. In fact, he was closer to her side than to mine. Before he could answer, Jamal entered the office. Several coaches began trying to talk to him and encourage him. He walked straight towards me. Reggie, I called. He looked at me. He had the same job I had when I started, and he reminded me a lot of myself, except he never played ball. I need you to call and find all of our players except the starting five. I want them all to be in the training room at two o'clock in the afternoon for training. Tell them to be prepared to spend most of the day and early evening there. For those of you who don't know, I said loudly, Jerry passed away last night. A trick. I wish someone would organize some kind of tribute for him. Email me or call me with details when you figure this out. Funeral arrangements are still being made. I plan to attend them. As I turned to leave, Jamal caught up with me. Coach, I called you about a hundred times last night, he said. You were only one of two people who did it, I replied sharply. You didn't tell Coach Shu, he said. Why do you think so? I asked. Only by the fact that he didn't strangle me when I walked past him, he said. He nodded to me the same way he always did. So he can't know anything about what you saw. Can't you slow down? He asked. I really need to talk to you. I'm here as a representative of the team. Coach, you can't believe how sorry they all are. I stopped and turned to him. I looked at him, and he looked me straight in the eyes. Why the hell aren't you sorry? I yelled at him. Listen, coach, can't we go somewhere where we won't be overheard? He asked quietly. I was asked to come and talk to you for several reasons. One of them is that although we are all ashamed of what we have done, I am different from them. How are you different? I asked. Because he's black, Jamal. Or because you are from the outback, or some other cliche. No, coach, he said. You never treated me any differently than other guys. The difference is that I never had sex with your wife. I also wish. I'm sorry I didn't tell you when this all started. But you have to understand, I was blackmailed by everyone. When it all started, I remember asking them how they could even look you in the E after they betrayed you. By then, I was already in love with Jennifer Shu. I wouldn't change her for anything. None of the other guys have regular girlfriends, so to them any woman is just a woman. They made it clear to me very quickly that if I opened my mouth, her father would find out within minutes, and I would probably never see her again. Besides, as your wife explained, this is all for the sake of both of you anyway. What? I asked. I didn't want to talk to him anymore because I had a headache. Coach, you need to talk to her, he said. If we keep winning, she'll have all the money she needs and this will all be over. Listen, Jamal, I said. Just get away from me. None of this makes any sense. Coach, you need to talk to the guys and sort everything out before the game, he said. No, I said. Don't want to. Well, then at least talk to your wife, he said. No, Jamal, I shouldn't do that either, I said, and walked away from him. When I walked out the door, a crowd of reporters was waiting for me. Coach, you are one victory away from reaching the final four for the first time in the history of your school. Can you give us... No comment, I said. Do you think Billy Bathgate is taking steroids? No comment, I said walking briskly through them with my head down. It seemed that if I didn't look them in the eye, they wouldn't ask me any questions. For some reason, basketball didn't seem important to me because my whole life and marriage was falling apart. I walked to my car and got into it, started the engine. The sound of the big V8 sent most of them scattering and the rest moving out of the way as I slowly moved forward. When they cleared the passage, I rushed away from there, hoping that the stones thrown into the air behind me did not hurt anyone. I just needed to get away to think. I drove through the city streets, away from the city center. 
Every playground I passed by had small or large groups of kids playing basketball. Watching some of them made me smile. This is a game in its purest form. No boosters or alumni to please. No NCAA committees or coaches. No university commitments or program expectations. Just throw the ball into the hoop and score points. I drove even further and came to a large park. I got out of the car and began to look for a place where I could just relax and think. It was deserted here, and there was a chill in the air. Spring is still too far away for the weather to be this warm. Here the weather was cool, 10 degrees. But at home, I'm sure our temperature will be in the same digit. I sat next to a group of older men playing chess. Chess is an exciting game. It teaches strategy and helps a person learn to concentrate their thoughts and solve problems. My job has taught me the same skill set. I had to develop strategies for my team to help them win against teams that are stronger on paper. I had to learn to maximize our strengths and limit our weaknesses, while at the same time exploiting every weakness of the opponent. I needed to do the same here. The first thing I need to do is break down the problem into its component parts and decide how I feel about them and what I will do. There was so much to consider that I wished I had a notepad to take notes on. First of all, it is the pain and emptiness that I felt at that moment. The pain, as I understand it, is caused by betrayal. I was betrayed by the people closest to me, all at the same time. If Gloria had simply had an affair, it would have been devastating, but not nearly as destructive. I could dive in and focus on my team while we figured out the details and decided what to do, or if it was a case of the guys on the team doing something like gambling or cutting points, I would again feel betrayed but could focus on my life outside of basketball. Maybe Gloria and I could go somewhere to be alone while I figure out what to do about the team situation. In this case, I lost two of the most important things in my life at the same time. Losing both at the same time was beyond my strength. Last night I did something crazy. I walked into a strange bar and tried to drink myself to death. I was very lucky that I was not robbed or killed. It was lucky that the girl I allowed to interview the team worked there. I may never be so lucky again in my life. Just as I was contemplating my situation, the phone rang. It was Al. Boss, we have a problem, he said. There are no available hotel rooms in the city. I even tried going into some seedy motels on the outskirts of town. They are all busy until the end of the tournament. Several hotels have said they have possible availability when teams are eliminated, but most of them have waiting lists because the closer to the championship finals, the greater the demand. Thanks, Al, I said. I'll think of something. Maybe I'll just spend two nights in the office. Boss, he said, will they find you another room after the game? There's no way we can lose this game. We have already beaten them both at home and away, and now we are better than we were the last time we played them. They also have a couple of injuries, so they just won't be able to give it their all. We'll talk to you later, Al, I said. It's been an incredible year, hasn't it? He asked. Jerry would like to have a year like this at least once. I just wish he was here with us to see it, I said. When I hung up the phone, I felt even sadder than when I picked it up. My phone immediately rang, and thinking it was all again, I answered. Jim, dear, it's not what you think. You must allow... I immediately pressed the end button and ended the call. This will teach me not to look at the screen before answering. The phone barely had time to return to his pocket when it rang again. It was a cell phone number and from my home region. I got Fred's number and answered the call. Yes, Fred, I said. Jim, this is not Fred. This is Millicent. I'm using Fred's phone, hoping you'll pick up. I think it would be a safe bet since technically he's your boss, she said. What does technically mean? I asked. Well, you know how things work at the university level, she said. It's all about the dollars and the students and keeping boosters and alumni happy. Fred is in charge of our losing football team. This year they played 10 games and lost eight of them. Now they take on newbies who eventually start playing. Our girls' gymnastics team barely has enough members to field a team and even at our home meets, the stands are usually dominated by visiting team fans, and we have to give them space on our side of the floor, as well as theirs. 
She sighed. When it comes to college sports, you're a big deal, and we all know it. You can write yourself a ticket. If you wanted, you could take Fred's place. Anyway, that's not why I'm calling you. I know what you're calling me about, I said coldly, and I don't want to talk to you about it. Listen, Jim, she said. You have always been a reasonable guy. Gloria cried all night. She's going crazy, and it's not her fault. It's my fault. Nonsense, I said. Gloria is 33 years old. She's a grown woman, and I did not see anyone holding a gun to her head. In fact, the only thing I saw near her head were men. You, on the other hand, were too busy doing your own thing to pay attention to what Gloria was doing, so I don't think it's your fault. Don't worry, I intend to keep this all a secret until after the tournament. Tell Gloria she can continue to do whatever she wants, I'll just file for divorce, and we'll figure it out this summer. But, she began, before I hung up. My phone rang again. I was getting angrier every second. I always thought the main purpose of having a cell phone was convenience. This is also great in emergency situations, but right now it's just outrageous. What? I said, answering the call. Sorry, I'm just calling to check on you, she said. Well, you know, see how you cope with a hangover. No, sorry, Molly, I said. You won't believe what kind of day I'm having today. Between what happened to me last night, both before I got drunk and after, yesterday was a nightmare. Today I'm trying to just move on to free myself. But everywhere I turn, there are people looking for a story or people wanting to talk to me to explain why sticking a knife in the back or the heart isn't as bad as it seems, you know. Well, Jim, we screwed you, but it's actually not that bad. She laughed, and her laugh was musical. It looks like you're dealing with a bunch of diplomats, she said. Eh? I asked. I thought I had missed something. My dad always told me that a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell and actually look forward to it, she laughed. Thinking about this, I also had to suppress my laughter. Molly, you are the only pleasant thing that happened to me after the game ended, I said. Well, aren't you cute, she said. This makes me feel even worse. Why, I asked. Well, I called to ask you for a favor, she said. Go ahead, I said. I can't, she answered. Eh? I answered. I'm terrible at basketball. I don't know how to throw even to save my ass, she laughed. Because I'm tall, all the schools I went to tried to make me play basketball. But I'm much better at volleyball. We both laughed. Okay, Molly. Now I owe you two times, I said. I owe you once for cheering me up last night, and once for cheering me up now. Don't forget the other part. She grinned. You remember the promise you made to me when you were drunk. I thought I explained to you that I'm married, I said. I was quite ready to let you go as soon as you said that, she said. Then you told me that, you know, what happened to you yesterday that caused you to fall out of the cart. Now, in my book, that means you could soon be free. So if you get divorced, you are my debtor. If you settle everything... You are not off the hook. Well, since I owe you so much, what kind of favor is it? I asked. Maybe I can work off at least part of my debt. Well, my dad really wants to take my nephew to the game tomorrow night, she said. But it's simply impossible to get tickets. Okay, I said. I have a few unused front row tickets left for family members of the players. I'll bring you three of them today. If you're not at home, I'll just put them under the door. You'll probably be busy today, won't you? She asked. I could pick them up from your office or somewhere else and save you the trouble. Molly, I have no idea where I'll be most of the day, I said. I don't even know where I'll sleep tonight. Don't you have a luxury hotel room like other big shots? She laughed. I have a luxurious suite, I said. Oh, I love chocolate, she said. What kind of chocolate is included in the luxury candy? Molly, you know what I mean, I said. Yes, I understand, she replied. You know that if you need to, you can always stop at the same place you stopped last night. I work from six to two, so you can come in and get the keys from either the apartment or the bar. Molly, this is too much of a favor, I said. But thanks anyway. I promise I'll bring the tickets, 
so tell Daddy he's coming. I got back in the car and drove back to the arena. The training has almost started. Before I was interrupted, I understood the problems I was facing. I just had to figure out what I wanted to do about them. The biggest problem was my marriage. Gloria and I were together for ten years. These were very good years. Without her, I was lost. Even now it seemed to me that I was working in automatic mode. I felt hurt and betrayed. But is that enough to just leave a good marriage? How much selfishness is there in my pain? Am I really angry or just jealous? Am I afraid of competition? Was it all because seeing my wife cheat with men who were physically better made me feel inferior? What about my team? What did I want to do there? This part was easy. They betrayed me, so they must pay. And they will pay. I've already figured out how. I think it all comes down to basketball. This is a simple game with simple rules. If you break the rules, you are punished. If you're too aggressive, you get a foul. A very aggressive foul can get you kicked out of the game. The question is, does Gloria deserve to be kicked out of the game or just punished? My dad always said that in the most difficult situations, the right thing is usually the thing that is the hardest to do. Every being in me told me that I had to find a way to forgive Gloria and my crew. I have often said that I owe my life to Gloria. And in some ways, I owe my professional success and the life of my career to my team. But that doesn't mean I owe any of them my self-respect or sanity. I thought about Jerry Attrick again. He was a great coach, spent my entire career without doing what I did this year but he died happy and surrounded by friends and people who loved him. Now I had a lot of success, but did I even have one person I could truly count on and trust? I had to honestly answer that no. When it came to the end, they all let me down. The only thing I could do was start over and find people I could rely on. Instead of lecturing my players and trying to find the best strategy to win at all costs, I had to make sure they understood that the most important thing is to simply do the best you can with what you have. Sometimes, an honest loss when you give it your all is better than an unfair victory. In the arena parking lot, I made a few calls to Michigan. The first person I called was Sheila. She was surprised to hear me. I asked her when the funeral was. She said it was Saturday and asked if I wanted her to say something to me. I said I would say everything myself because I would be there. Jim, it's the final four on Saturday, she said. I'll be there, I said. Whether we win this game or not doesn't matter, I'll be there. Jerry's funeral is much more important than any basketball game. Even if it was a championship game, I would still come to see Jerry off. There was silence on the line for several moments. Then you need to write something to say, because you'll be giving the eulogy, she said. Afterwards, we had a party at our house to watch the game. This is what Jerry would have wanted, she said. Maybe you and Gloria will come too. I will definitely come. But Gloria and I probably won't be together, Sheila. See you soon. I hung up and felt better. The next call was to my lawyer's home. I asked him to prepare the divorce papers and told him that I needed to do it as quickly as possible. I also asked him to place notices in newspapers here and in Michigan stating that I was not involved with Gloria and was not responsible for her debts. Thinking again about what Jamal said, I was sure that Gloria was involved in something. I got out of the car and walked into the arena through the back exit. As I approached the doors, I heard footsteps behind me. I looked up and saw Joel and Igor heading towards me. I showed my pass and walked past the guard. When I reached the training ground, I told the guard that this was a closed training session and that no one was allowed in except the people on the list. He showed me the list, and I immediately crossed off the names of my starting five. I slipped through the door and watched as Igor and Joel were denied entry. But this is team training, Joel said. Sorry, dude, you're not on the list, the guard said. Before you go, could you autograph this T-shirt for my child? When I entered, several members of my staff were already there. There were about 15 players there. Neither of them picked up the ball or warmed up. Get off your asses and get ready to play, I shouted. They looked at me like I was crazy. Several of my substitutes jumped up and grabbed the balls. The others continued doing what they were doing. I walked up to Al and took his whistle. I blew it loud enough to scare 
Everyone in the room, the fat guy in the stands next to me, dropped his phone and broke it. I was sure I saw moisture creeping down his legs. Coach, I need to go to the locker room for five minutes, he said. Take ten, I said. The rest of you, line up for throwing practice. But why? asked one of the guys. It's not like we're going to play or anything like that. All of you will play in tomorrow's game. And when we win, you all will play in the final four. Maybe even in the championship. Laughter rang out across the entire floor. Even my assistant coaches looked at me like I was crazy. Oh, I get it, Al said. You're going to alternate them throughout the game, giving each a minute or two. This is a kind of reward for the season we are having. And they will all tape the game and have something to show their children years from now when they become bankers or police officers or plumbers, right? This is actually a good thing, Jim, especially for high school students. Everyone nodded their heads in agreement. That's why there's no starting five, said one of the players, whose name, to my chagrin, I didn't even know. Yes, said the other. We're here at a special intensive camp to learn how to act without looking stupid on television. We have to learn how to dribble and shoot and shit like that. Then I realized two things. The first was that we have problems. And secondly, this training will take much longer than I thought. I asked Al and Gini to line them up and begin dribbling drills. Once we had five guys who were semi-decent and could at least dribble the ball on the floor without moving, I moved them to the second group where we started learning to pass. It was terrible. We had to repeat what kids learned to do in middle school and on the playground in elementary school. I couldn't believe these guys were on my team. It just showed how focused I was on my starting five and winning games to the detriment of the rest of the team. I will never repeat this mistake. We started practicing different types of throws, and then one of the guards entered the room. He came up and said that my wife was outside and wanted to see me. At first, I thought about telling him to send it, but then I had a better idea. I said we're in the midst of it told him to ask if she could wait ten minutes until we had a break, and then I would see her. As soon as he headed towards the exit, I walked out through the locker room door. He went out the back door, got into his car, and drove to the hotel. I took the elevator up to our room and waved to a few people who wanted to wish me well. Inside the room, I looked through all of Gloria's things. At first there was nothing unusual, but then I found this. Gloria was always very detailed. Like me, she didn't store important things on the computer. I found a small notepad in her box with her bank account number and password. I logged in using the password and found out that Gloria had almost $100,000 in her account. I also noticed where she bet on basketball games. Every time a team won, its fortune increased. The odds of our opponents winning tomorrow were 10 to 1. The odds of us winning are only 4 to 1. Gloria looked at the notepad where the number was circled. The figure is $300,000. This is probably the amount of money she thinks she needs to move away from me and live the life she wants. However, according to her records, Gloria bet more money than was in the account. Under normal circumstances, this would have been a dangerous but relatively safe bet. Because we were clearly going to win this game, she planned to bet much more conservatively in the next game and didn't even make a prediction for the national championship game. The fog gradually cleared. Gloria would bet on games and have sex with my players as an incentive to win. But some moments were simply meaningless. How did it all start? Why? I knew I would never win any prizes for being the perfect husband. For almost half the year, I was dedicated to my team. The rest of the time, I always made amends to her. Over the past ten years, we have gone on vacation to any place she wanted to see. I bought her everything she ever asked for and was confident that she knew that if our life became too bad for her, I would step down and take a less responsible position. But what bothered me the most was that she was the one who always encouraged me to do what I did. In fact, when we first met, I was a coach, so she knew what to expect from our relationship. Maybe it was just that the years of this relationship had worn her down. However, all she had to do was let me know. If I had the chance to choose between my job and Gloria, I would choose Gloria in a second. Look at me now. Forget about basketball. I'm not myself. I run around contemplating career suicide just to ease the pain in my heart. I have no idea what I will do next or where I will end up. 
I only know that I must do something to numb the pain. It's always so easy to debate what's right and what's wrong when the problem is something else. It's easy to say, hey, she has the right to do whatever she wants with her body, or the only thing we're looking at here is your fragile male ego. It's easy to say such things when it's not your wife or girlfriend who is cheating on you. I have to decide what is right for me. There's nothing I can do to try and save everyone. This situation simply does not allow this. Of course it could have happened, maybe if I had been more mature. Maybe if I were a more complete being, and above all these petty concerns about whether Gloria loved me or not, or whether I was better in bed than some 22-year-old athlete. But, unfortunately, I'm not like that. I'm an ordinary guy who doesn't know a damn thing about women and what motivates them. Stephen Hawking once said that he had the highest IQ in the world, but he still didn't understand women. I'm nowhere near his league when it comes to intelligence, so don't expect me to understand them either. All I can say is that I truly gave her the best I could, gave her my whole heart and every ounce of love I had. If that's not enough, then screw her, because from now on she won't get anything from me. As for my team, screw them too. I brought these bastards out of obscurity, routine, and prison, led them to the brink of signing contracts with the NBA. They would all become famous and millionaires. But since I created them, I can just as easily break them. The great thing about this is that none of this would require much effort on my part. I put Gloria's notebook back and left the room. I took the rest of my clothes and personal belongings with me. That way I wouldn't have to come back here for any reason. I returned to the arena. Al and Jean cornered me and immediately asked me what was going on. You should see Gloria, Jim, Al said. She was always very beautiful, but you can hardly tell that this is the same woman I remember sitting in the stands behind us watching the game last night. I know she's your wife, but she looked damn good. Jin nodded. You're acting strange too, what did you do? Her eyes are red and bloodshot, Al continued. Hair is a mess. It seems like she just doesn't care. Okay, give me two teams of five people. We've spent enough time studying. Let's give them some combat experience. You two as referees. Use whistles, the whole nine meters. Let's make this as close to a game situation as possible. If any of the men were saddened by my quick distancing, they did not show it. In the end, around eight o'clock, I sent the guys home. I'm sure this was a violation of NCAA rules regarding the amount of practice time allowed, but I didn't care. I had to make this game at least look believable. I returned to the office, only to have one of our assistants drop me a ton of messages. Only one of them was worth answering. Gloria left me 50 messages today alone. I deleted the whole bunch. Millicent called me twice, as did Harriet. There was another stack of messages from my starting five. Most of them talked about how desperately each of them wanted to see me or talk to me. They also wondered why they were banned from training. I asked Al to hold a press conference and just give fun but non-serious answers to all the questions. I called Dean Michael Martin. The conversation was interesting. Hi, Jim, he said. Thank you for answering my call. I know how busy you are. Let me get straight to the point. You're not planning to do anything stupid, are you? What are you talking about? I said. Well, I know there's something going on between you and your wife, he said. I learned about this from my wife, who claims that she is trying to act as an intermediary. She says Gloria is confused and you're being an asshole. Said she couldn't go into detail, but you're acting like a Neanderthal because the girls had a little party and you still expect Gloria to be on your arm. Said that when they asked some guys who was right, even your team, the team you created, was on Gloria's side. So now you're angry at them and freezing them out too. Is any of this true? Dean Martin, with all due respect, sir, when I took this job, you told me that I would have autonomy in matters affecting my team. There is a reason for everything I do, so I'd rather you stay out of this matter. I've brought us quite far, and I still believe I can take us even further, I said. But seriously, at the moment, I didn't care. Jim, I get questions from all kinds of fans, he said. For the first time in my life, people are asking me to accept donations for the program. Much of this money could go toward other college needs. Honestly, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Please don't do anything that might ruin everything. If I do, don't worry, I said. You can just fire me. 
I'm sure after this year I'll be able to go somewhere else and find a job. I have more than a few suggestions. I decided to take the tickets to Molly's apartment. Was going to do this, mainly because I really couldn't remember where the bar she works at was located. I found it yesterday because I was so enraged by what I just saw that I just walked into the first bar I saw. Coming out of there, I was in no condition to remember anything more complex than how to breathe. Molly met me at the door before I could slide the tickets under it. Well, how was your day? She asked. Wow, please don't tell me you're serious. These are tickets not only for your game, but also for all remaining games, including the game in the final. Thank you very much. My dad will be happy. This clears all your debts to me. Well, except for that promise. I looked sideways at her and she laughed. So, you made peace with the little woman? No, I answered sadly. I learned some things I didn't even know about. I still don't know the reason for all this, but I just don't see us getting back together. It hurts me too much. There was simply no reason for all this. We could talk about everything that was bothering her. Well, I mean, think about it. All day, every day, I have hot young cheerleaders shaking their asses in my face. I have reporters asking me questions and ball bunnies asking about players or just tickets, willing to do anything to get what they want. I never even thought about taking any of them because I thought I was in love. Damn, I was in love. And what did this give me? Nothing, damn it. That's what. And tell you what, if I went out into the street and grabbed most of the ass on offer, I'd be a dog or worse. And now I just feel like a loser. I have a good idea to just go and fuck the first woman that comes near me and send the video to Gloria to see how she feels, I said. Wow, Molly said. It won't make you feel better. You will most likely feel worse. You would simply try to enter into a competition with a woman of easy virtue for sex, and she would surpass you in both experience and professionalism. Besides, your first post-divorce sexual activity is already agreed upon, remember? From the way she smiled... I couldn't tell whether she was serious or not. Where will you stay tonight? She asked. I'll come in and check if you got so drunk that you couldn't walk. Probably in my office in the arena, I said. Okay, agreed, she said. Give me your keys. I will go to work in your car. How can I return to the arena? I asked. You won't go back there, she said. Stay here with me. Molly, you only have one bedroom. Yesterday you didn't sleep all night. I can't expect you to do that again, I said. That would be wrong. Who didn't sleep last night, she asked. You and I slept in the same bed. I just got up before you. Everything was fine last night. Everything will be fine today, too. Keys. I handed her the keys and she smiled. I don't have any alcohol here, but you can eat whatever you want. Well... There's something here that you should eat, and I'm sure you'll like it, but I'll take it with me to work. I heard her laugh as she closed the door and left. Continued in the next video. Subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so you don't miss the second final part. The link to the second part will be in the description of this video below. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.